in isolated communities. So here's the background. For me, it's all about fiber. All about fiber. That's the essential infrastructure, just as electricity was the essential infrastructure 100 years ago that many people didn't have. And it took a seismic social movement. It took the involvement of FDR and his willingness to take on the special interests who weren't that interested in um, making sure that everybody had cheap, reliable electricity. And it took a lot of cheerfulness and a lot of people working together. And today, just as our great-grandfathers bravely ensured that electricity would be present across the United States, it's our obligation to ensure that fiber reaches into every corner. My own background, um, the, you know, why I got here, has a lot to do with uh, my childhood. I grew up in a practice room. I was a violinist. I still am a violist every day. Pretty isolated, I have to say. One of my high school classmates is here, Drew Digby. He can tell you whether or not this is true or not. I, it, it was, from my perspective, very quiet, very quiet background. And I happened to uh, become a young lawyer at the same time the internet was born, the commercial internet. And the very first website I went to was from my hometown. I'm from Santa Monica, California. And there was a beach house that had been set up online with a bunch of 20-somethings under one roof. And if you clicked here, you could talk to them. And I remember distinctly the moment I clicked there. And it was as if there was the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. It was unbelievable. It was like the coats parted and I got to interact with people thousands of miles away. And I've never forgotten that feeling of human connection, which is at the heart of why we love high-speed internet access so much. So I got involved in internet politics along the way, and significant for today's talk, I represented Dot Co-op, the organization seeking a top-level domain name for the cooperative associations across the world. And I became very enamored of the cooperative uh, way of doing business and of working together, which is, has such a deep and distinguished history here in Minnesota. I became a member of the ICANN board. Uh, they're the people who deal with top-level domains and uh, IP addresses, and saw firsthand the international issues at work in internet access. And it, I found it dehydrating, frankly, and a little uh, <coughs> tiring, um, but I, it was like jury duty for the internet, and I was very proud to get the chance to do it. And then I, I got this opportunity, as Chris mentioned, to serve on the White House staff, and that was revelatory for me on several layers. I, I remember learning that there were heroes behind the walls of every governmental organization, really terrific people doing their best, thinking about internet access, working against impossible odds. I also learned that there are a lot of people in government today, my age, who don't quite understand how fundamental, very high capacity internet access is for our future in the 21st century. I understand that getting anything done is really hard inside uh, the walls of government. And here was a moment for me. I went in to talk to a senior government official to say, we should shift some lifeline funding from phone access, where it's traditionally been supporting the poorest people in America who can't get access to phones, shift that to high-speed internet access. And the guy, and they're all guys, so I'm not you know, distinguishing anything here. The guy said, but phones are two-way. <sighs> OK, so get that. Hang on to that. Like that this was just a few years ago. And uh, life has not changed that much. We have a lot of educating to do at every level of government. And I also most fundamentally learned that there's no path, no path to a national fiber upgrade across the country. And we have, you know, a bunch of fiber running between cities. Um, here's a level three map showing these great big cables, but nothing in the last mile. And as a result, when it comes to the penetration of fiber connections, the United States is somewhere in the middle of the pack when we really should be looking at the rest of the world in the rearview mirror. We're the country that invented the internet, right? But the new generation of internet activity is not going to come from the United States unless we fix this problem. We also know that we pay far too much for internet access in America compared to uh, selected other developed nations. This isn't true, for example, across the EU. The Italians also pay a lot. But uh, for those sensible Northern European countries and for much of Asia, we're paying far too much for very inferior connections. And 
here's what you get for $50 a month across the world. So you can see that Hong Kong and Seoul and Tokyo get you a lot for $50 a month, and the United States, not so much, except where um, competitive fiber exists. So a little bit more about this story. I, as Chris mentioned, it, this did lead me, this experience, to write captive audience. Almost everybody I interviewed said they had to be talked to off the record because this was just too dangerous a subject. But luckily now it's become much more mainstream. Since I wrote the book, everybody's talking about the problems here. So, you know, you might say we've got a lot of wires across America. Look at all these different providers, you know, a whole bunch of them. Um, New Frontier and Windstream are two of your incumbents here in Minnesota. So is Comcast and Charter now a merger between Time Warner Cable, Charter and Bright House. So in terms of size of providers, a whole bunch of big ones across the country. So we should be doing fine, right? But it turns out that uh, and we know the difference between fiber, hybrid fiber coaxial, fiber to the node, and DSL. Just, just everybody should have in your mind that whenever you talk about DSL, it's the new dial-up. It is as far behind today as dial-up was a few years ago. And fiber to the home is the connection, the physical connection that will be symmetrical, potentially unlimited in its capacity to carry information, and infinitely upgradable. Just swap out the electronics at the edge, and you're, you're on. Cable, the hybrid fiber coaxial connection, great for passive reception of content, but we're not a passive country. We're a country that invents things and does new things. Cable, unless it's substantially architected anew, will never have the capacity of uh, fiber to the home. And fiber to the node, also a, a sort of dim second. It really depends on your distance to the, to the central office. So uh, maybe, you know, 10 years ago, these two uh, connections, copper and cable, were roughly similar, roughly same price. Since then, cable has gone through a very cheap upgrade and has been grabbing all the high-speed internet access subscriptions. More than 100% of new net subscriptions recently went to the cable operators in the United States. And DSL is falling off the map as people flee it, and the the telcos, seeing that cable is winning, are withdrawing from their wires in many parts of the United States. So uh, Verizon's selling off its wire, its, uh, even its uh, fiber connections in uh, Texas and Florida and California, leaving the territory to cable. So where both cable and Fios is, Fios usually wins. People really like fiber. Take-up rates are very high. Where cable is against all the other telcos, cable always wins. And where the bigger cable companies are that have advantages of scale, they always win. And smaller telcos lose even more. I mean, these are just basic principles about how this it works. And all the major cable actors never enter each other's territories. They're very polite to each other. In the summer of love, they divided up their systems. And uh, it all, this is totally economically sensible. They're for-profit companies. This is in their interest to act in this way. So we have divided markets and uh, what we might call bounded competition at most. So more on this, just so you have the background, especially for your incumbents, they face very little overlap with anybody else. So usually if you're in a place with, say, Frontier or CenturyLink, almost no competition from anybody else. So they have no incentive to upgrade to fiber or to provide you with better services or cheaper services. Um, so very, very little overlap. So where competitive fiber isn't, your incumbents uh, don't face competition. They have complete pricing and service level power. They can do whatever they want. And here are some city maps from other places in the country. The top rank is places showing fiber, showing, I'm sorry, cable footprints. And the, each color is a particular cable operator. And they just never compete with each other. Makes total sense. Below are DSL territories. Again, no competition. So we have a little tiny bit of national fiber. That's the Fios system. And um, you can see it's sprinkled on the coasts and is now going to be withdrawn from even places like California and Texas. So where I'm teaching now at Harvard, Boston doesn't have fiber. The leafy, rich suburbs around it do have Fios. And nowhere deeper in the state of Massachusetts does Fios exist. So that's, that's where they're devoting their energies. Um, this leads to a huge problem for the United States. For most Americans, you have at most one choice for uh, anything of 25 megabits per second or more. 
and you pay whatever that operator wants to charge. And the, these are maps from the, uh, or tables from the FCC showing this. Where Google Fiber shows up, that does prompt the incumbents to react. Um, and we have seen as Google Fiber marches into town that AT&T and these other guys will react and suddenly say, oh yeah, we can do this, we can do this, and start selling services. But Google Fiber is a very limited uh, operation. Even when it reaches all the cities it's, it's considering, it's on, only going to pass about 4.3 million homes, small fraction of American households. We do not want to wait for Google Fiber because we would be swapping out one monopoly for another, for one thing, and uh, because they're not going to come to places where they think the business case doesn't exist. Take up rates, though. Here's what's fascinating. People love fiber. They're buying this. At, at the, the Wall Street says that at least 40% of the households in the Google Fiber households are taking Google Fiber. So it's proving as to be a product that people really want. So here's a map from Chris showing those 450 places that are trying to install fiber, some of them with gigabit access, um, many uh, towns taking their destiny into their own ta hands and moving forward. Sometimes people talk to me about, you know, why do you need fiber? What's the point? And I try to come up with human stories that will convey this to you. Here's one. I have a friend who's a violinist in Macon, Georgia. His name is Bobby McDuffie, and he has a conservatory there in this beautiful old antebellum house in Macon. With the help of the Knight Foundation, they're cooking up a fiber connection to a conservatory in Miami. Here are the kids in Miami. That will allow these people to play together, to actually play together with only a pane of glass between them. No delays of any kind. No feeling that they're distant from each other. I hope See, that feels really human to me, to really be in the same place. Only with fiber is this possible to make music together. And there's, that's where my background as a musician really helps to, to get this. I, I also think that there will be effects on empathy, awareness on other people other than ourselves that are possible with this pane of glass and not quite possible with the current internet connections we have. We're really connected. You're in the doctor's office. You're in the classroom. You're not a second-class citizen. You're part of the experience. Until you've felt this, very hard to imagine it. Human beings' imaginations are quite limited. But take it from me. This is a genuine change. This is as different from current internet access as having electricity was different from not having it in the past, 100 years ago. So. One, another big use for fiber is going to be in, in cities that are collecting data, understanding their citizens, not in a big brother surveillance way, but really becoming responsive to what citizens need. The layer will be open fiber with sensors and algorithms above it so that the city hall that used to be closed to all of us becomes open and let, lets down at Portacolis and becomes something that's trusted in American society. I'm seeing this a, a lot in Chicago, where they're uh, working closely with community groups and technicians at the University of Chicago to use their fiber network to, in a, in a sense, put a, a wellness tracker on the streets of Chicago. How's the city feeling? What's, it, what's the environmental data showing? What do we know about noise and light levels in the city? All of this is only possible with a fiber network, because the tsunami of data that's created can't be carried by the existing networks we've got. So the real killer app, though, is economic development, and that's going to be true in Minnesota as it is around the world. Fiber networks enable lots of people to work from home, start new businesses, join new businesses, educate their children, provide health care at much lower costs. New jobs, new businesses, and the attraction of talent. Everybody in the country is competing for talent, and you'll need fiber in order to hang on to it. And enormous health care and education benefits. It's just basic infrastructure. This is a simple step from what we have now to fiber. So here are a few stories, maybe you know these, about places in America that have adopted fiber and are seeing great economic impact, new businesses, uh, new valuations for those businesses with all fiber networks. Chattanooga is often in the news, um, really interesting place with, that starts from a utility and ends up having fiber everywhere and uh, lots of new jobs and some new innovation districts that they're creating and a mayor who really gets it and talks about this light and rift. Really, um, local leadership is essential to this story. 
So uh, Chattanooga is another good one. Uh, Salisbury, North Carolina, the very first place in the country to be offering 10 gigabit speeds. And that enables uh, college students to be able to work with whatever data they want and uh, lots of new businesses in a very proud town. So the future is all about rich, immersive digital media. That's where we're going. And you can say media to yourself, but just think humans. If this becomes too alien, think about being able to work with humans in a real way without the mediation of delay or jitter or frustration. That's what's possible. So they had a lot of attacks there in Salisbury, but they, they managed to build this network. And Santa Monica, so Drew, here we look up, Drew. That is our hometown. That's the entrance to the pier. Um, they have a very exciting uh, fiber network that was built by the city using uh, the money they saved by walking away from the incumbents for their own city network, plowing that money back into serving businesses, and now they're moving towards getting fiber to the home in Santa Monica. So it's a city network, inexpensive, bringing lots of new businesses to our hometown of 90,000 and right next to the city of Los Angeles, which has nothing of the sort and is trying to figure out how to get to this situation. So Minnesota, a lot of good news here and a lot of it represented in this room. Lots of heroes. I'm gonna to hope to call out some of you in this presentation. The state infrastructure grants are very important and it's terrific that they're happening. And all credit to the governor and Dan McKenzie and the, uh, the Broadband Task Force in making sure this happens. Broad political support for those grants is important and needs to be sustained. But here's my message for you. That's all fine, that's great, but you can do better. This state can do better, especially with its background in the cooperative movement and the progressive ethos. So here's the problem. Minnesota's existing high-speed internet access goals haven't been met. You promised yourself that by the end of 2014, by 2015, you would be at a particular place and you're not there. Just 86% have access to the state's current goal of 10 megabits per second, five up. And uh, you're not in the top five states as you were hoping to be, you're 19th. Um, the gaps also at the same time are widening. Some counties have very high adoption, very high penetration. Some have alarmingly low adoption. That's a real problem. And we know that that's gonna create a class of second class citizens here in Minnesota and your prices are far too high, just to let you know. So Minnesota, exclamation point. <laughs> you should be looking the rest of the country in the rear view mirror. Really, this state should be leading the country. Uh, it's really time for some new recommendations from the governor's broadband task force, and luckily this is the time when they're thinking of new recommendations. So you won't be surprised to hear that I have some. And, uh, and they're based on facts. So here, here are some facts, fact one. Federal funding is not gonna do it. Don't wait for the feds. They do have something called the Connect America Fund <laughs> CAF too, but it's gonna be rolling out very slowly and a very second class connection. Six years, right? To bring uh, 10 megabits per second, one up. Basically, I speak politely, but that is a crappy wireless connection. That's nothing like what your citizens are going to need to compete in the 21st century. And the recipients of that money are the current incumbents who have no particular desire to undermine their position. And remember, don't face competition in the places where they are. So that provides no incentive to move to this basic infrastructure, which is glass, fiber in the ground. Fiber and Wi-Fi is the future, and this funding is not gonna help you get there. So don't wait for the feds. Okay, fact two, fiber, 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 fiber. Fiber is what you need. It's future-proof as far as we can tell. Um, it's warranted for decades. Once you get the glass in the ground, you just update it with electronics, you're, you're ready to go. Yes, Wi-Fi is important, but uh, people always say, well, with wireless, who needs fiber? You know, but that's like saying with airplanes, who needs airports? Uh, you need a place for that wireless signal to go. So Wi-Fi is great, high capacity, but it requires a fiber connection deep into neighborhoods to be able to carry all of that data, right? So fiber plus Wi-Fi, absolutely, but 95% of the Wi-Fi connection is the wire. So don't, don't rely on that. So fiber first, and don't wait for the federal funding. Here's the third fact. Wireless connection will never substitute for fiber capacity. Don't listen to people who try to bamboozle you and say, oh, I love my smartphone, this is all about wireless. That is a canard. 
Um, first of all, because you know I'm a lawyer by training, but the laws of physics come first before the American law. And the capacity of this glass with lasers inside it, as far as we can tell, is unlimited. Wireless will always be limited by interference, by the low um, scan of uh, bandwidth is being made available for internet access. And mobile wireless in particular is subject to data caps and overages that definitely make it not a substitute. If you try to swap out your use of your wire at home for smartphone use, you'd suddenly be facing a $400 a month bill. You just can't do this. So I'll just, I want to grind this home a little bit more because I think it's really important. These two things are complementary. Um, more than 85% of people who have a smartphone also have a wire at home. If you can afford it, you have both, so you need lower prices. And everybody, when they're asked, says, I would rather give up my smartphone than give up the wire at home. I need this to access the internet. Um, even more on this, uh, people, when they're asked about how they use these two ways of getting online, say, when I need to educate myself or learn about healthcare, or talk about education, I use that home connection. I do not use my smartphone for all the reasons I've just outlined. So lots of data on this, and, and the wonderful Chris Mitchell has all this for you as well. So don't be fooled. Uh, if you have a smartphone, most of you probably also have some kind of wire at home. Wi-Fi is certainly important, but that's not the same thing as mobile wireless and requires fiber. And hey, watch out, the cable companies are on track to offer Wi-Fi mobile wireless themselves. This is part of their business plan, uh, especially with the reemergence of Charter and John Malone. They're really thinking about blanketing all of their territories with wireless and Wi-Fi that is proprietary, that you'll be paying for as part of their bundles. So, you know, that's, this is part of the divided market story. Uh, and oh, just a note, so the wireless market has loved these data caps and the overages because it avoids the need to upgrade their facilities. They can just charge us for using more. Now Comcast on the wired side is getting to the game, not because of the limits on their network, but just because they can. They're going to start imposing data caps on the use of their wires. So if you start doing really first 21st century things with your Comcast connection, you'll be running into overages. So just watch that space, news coming there. Um, fact four, here's the amazing thing, you are already using gigabit connections. Did you know this? Amazing. But where they're happening is inside your computer and in the interfaces between your computer and the attachments that you glom onto it, data is moving around very quickly inside your house between your laptops and the next device. But what happens is, those are all thunderbolt attachments, very fast. What happens is when it gets to your roof, it hits an incredible bottleneck, which is your connection to the internet. So all the things you're doing are being suffocated, stymied by the absence of an adequate connection to the internet. And with fiber, we'll get that. So here's the fifth fact, um, and you know this, that we are creating two Americas, unless we get this right. Lower income Ameri Americans tend not to have a subscription to the internet in far greater numbers than richer ones, tend not to have devices, and the mi main obstacle is price. It's price, it's education and literacy, sure, but it's mostly price. So having a competitive fiber network is gonna make a huge difference. So um, Minnesota, back to you. So those are my five facts. I'm really inspired by RS Fiber. Um, taking this very rural area in southwest Minnesota and with some uh, funding plans that, by the way, the state of Massachusetts is now very interested in because we didn't know this was possible. But getting a lot of towns together to bond um, and supporting the network, getting lots of take up uh, and then bank loans to cover the rest, it's a thrilling story. And luckily, they're here. Um, Mark Erickson is right there. There he is, uh, and uh, what he's done is Tremendous. So look at that, your cooperative lighting the way. And here's something very important. Their pricing is dependable. They don't give you some teaser price and then say, oh, oh, a year from now, it's going to be something you don't notice that's a lot higher, which is what the incumbents routinely do. So you can find their pricing. They're providing a great service. And it's being done uh, in a cooperative way. And there's Mark. So there you are. So good work. That's a very heroic effort. And I know it takes a lot of people to do it. I'm singling out Mark because I want you to be inspired by that. So here's my idea. 
invest in Minnesota. Here's the headline. There's a huge, huge uh, surplus in the state. And I know there are a lot of competing needs. Some people say just return the money to the taxpayers. Don't do that. Invest in the state and invest in basic infrastructure. Put 100, 200 million into fiber infrastructure. This is just like electricity. It's basic to everything the state wants to do. Make this a priority, along with education, but you know, investment in this infrastructure is going to push the state forward. Here's a very interesting point. By providing state guarantees to, let's say, cooperative banking associations, with just putting just a little bit of money aside at the state level, frees up a lot of private investment capital. Think about that model. Find a way to get all the money that's sloshing around in private investment capital into the patient investments that's, that are necessary for building fiber in your state. They will, the private investors will make money until the sun explodes. It just pays back forever. And in return, the state will get the infrastructure it needs. So they're, they're, if this is just about money, it's not rocket science. And freeing up that private capital using state guarantees or city guarantees will make a big difference. So that's my first idea for you, invest in Minnesota. Uh, the second one is to, uh, well, the return on investment here will be dramatic. Healthcare, a lot of cities are looking at this and states. By being able to serve people remotely, my mother is aging in place, I want her to stay there. Having a fiber connection enables a kind of ambient awareness of how she is. If you need a doctor to come by, they can come. But most of the time, you won't have to visit the doctor because you can be there using fiber. Remember that human connection. Remember playing string quartets, same idea here. Uh, you can win the competition for talent, and economic growth is enormous. And retain your character, rural areas. I spend a lot of time in Maine. There are a lot of rural towns in Maine building fiber, and they want to hang on to their youth, not have them disappear. Without fiber, they won't be able to do that. Second recommendation, set high standards for the state. So invest in the state and set high standards. You should not be paying, you should not be supporting anything other than fiber. Don't throw money down a copper hole. Don't do that. Because you're going to have to make this adjustment, and you might as well start now. Um, paying for copper is throwing money away. As much as possible, require installation of dark fiber subject to public obligations. Wrinkle here, it's going to be important to enable competition where at all possible. And the model that I like to use uh, when talking about this comes from a very sensible place, Sweden, um, where they have in Stockholm something called Stokab. Here's a Stokab guy. Let me just tell you about this story. Um, Sweden deregulated its telecom market in the early 90s, but Stockholm was very worried about being under the thumb of its incumbents. It already had two lines under the streets. It had cable, it had DSL, it wanted fiber. And so 20 years ago, they built fiber under the streets of Stockholm. And 200 little towns in Sweden have also done this. And they lease out that fiber to competitors. So just think about what that enables for telecom infrastructure. Um, they have set costs for leasing fiber. They're never going to be under the thumb of anybody. And they, they're very sensible, so they don't want to rip up the streets too many times. They just did it once. So Stokab uh, really stays out of the private market and only offers uh, basic dark fiber services. Is so that a signal that I should start talking? Sorry, your mic's not working, so until we get it fixed, you speak. Oh, I thought I was yelling. Yeah. Can you turn that one on? Oh, the battery's dead. Oh, OK, you also need batteries. Can you hear me now? Oh, shoot, I was, it was all so interesting. <laughs> Thank you. OK, it was fading. OK, all right, so here we are. <clears throat> I, I found myself leaning close to the mic, so I know something was happening. Um, so Stokab, for all, all, this is a conservative model. Republicans should love this, because you stay out of the private market. It's just a street grid. The passive fiber is there, unlit, no electronics, controlled by a state entity, essentially. And then it's leased out at a set price to a bunch of competitors. And that's the private market. You don't intervene in the private market. You just provide the street grid. It's like a tree canopy. It's just a piece of infrastructure. So that's the Stokab model. They are coining money. It costs money to put this in, and now they're reaping the rewards. Um, uh, so here, they, they, they're showing us what it, their investments have been. And here's their profit after their financial 
items. They are turning around about $7 million a year from leasing out the dark fiber to competitors. And they did this with a lot of cooperation and a gradual deployment and a guarantee of neutrality that any business wanting to provide service could do so. This really works in urban areas. So think about Stokab. Christopher's also been there, uh, so he can report to you on the ground about what that's like. And here's a quote. What I like in Sweden is the open fiber. You flip open your laptop and you get a choice of 15 providers at a low price. Can we imagine that in America? No, right? So this is the place we need to get. Dark fiber is the way to do it. You're never under anybody's thumb at that point. Okay, third recommendation for the task force, sweat the details. There are a lot of regulatory things that can be cleaned up in order to make this easier for areas across the state. Um, you need to know where your assets are. You need to make sure that all your new buildings are uh, permitted and set up meet me points so that anybody can provide fiber. Just, this is like the root canal of policy, but it has to happen. And in Connecticut, one of your brethren in this effort, they managed to set up a single poll administrator so that only one actor needs to be talked to before you can get access to polls and you can't get hung up on uh, the incumbent's delay and other finagling uh, steps. So um, lots of details and lots of assistance across the country in, in making those details happen. Four, and this is essential and central to uh, Minnesota, cooperate. Your cooperative power is going to make this work. So the state grants are great and we also need guarantees. Everybody needs this capacity and you need some activism, some organizing to make sure that people have the political support they need to get this done. Co-ops are fantastic, also need new private providers. Also need the not-for-profit sector, the wonderful work that Blandin does, plus everybody else. This is everybody in this together, all for one, one for all in the state. So the big picture is for everything the state wants to do, economic growth, lower costs for health care, uh, better public safety, less inequality, losing, uh, making sure you don't lose your citizens, all of those priorities depend on having fiber in the state. So without that, what you're doing is building a house on sand because the data that you're working with won't be able to move around, so you're going to lose people from your uh, townships as well as your communities. So moving ahead, just overcome that asymmetry of information, talk about this openly, gather your assets, find that financing, you know, <coughs> smooth the way, do that pole attachment work, the root canal stuff. All so cheerful, all completely possible, just takes steady work, which is something that the people in this room are more than capable of. And aggregating public support, making sure that Dana has the support she needs, and the Broadband Task Force has the support it needs to be very aggressive in the uh, standards that you set and the steps that you decide to take as a state. So just three points. If you only remember three things from this presentation, here you go. This didn't happen by accident. It's because of policy that we have ended up in the situation we are now as a country and here in Minnesota of divided markets and very high prices and in inadequate infrastructure. Um, every Minnesotan needs a persistent, reliable, high capacity data connection in order to thrive in the 21st century world. Every single one. No one should be left behind. Wi-Fi is great, but it needs fiber. And wholesale fiber networks are like street grids. That's the other thing I want you to remember, that keeping dark fiber where possible really frees you up to have a competitive market and uh, sort of never-ending supply of capacity retail competition, the cloud of Wi-Fi, and local governance. So I like that optimistic little picture. There's fiber sweeping around the world, and it really is. In lots of other countries, it is the standard, just not yet in America. We need to get there. And we're just at the beginning. So thank you all very much.